and heresies and murder and envy and drunkenness and revilings and all this type of stuff that your professed Christians are always doing, constantly in these, involved in these things. And he tells you, I told you beforehand, and I'm telling you in times past, I'm telling you again, that those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. But like I said before, we found out a long time ago, and anybody else will if they go down this path, that it's very difficult to virtually impossible to find a preacher, a Bible pundit, or a pastor, or a study leader, a book writer, and out there today that agrees with these passages, that if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom. See, like the serpent in the, in the garden that I keep referring to, where it says, well, if we do this, God said, we'll die. No, thou shalt surely not die. Isn't that what Satan said through the serpent? Go ahead and do what God told you not to do, or it would kill you. Do it anyway, because it won't kill you. See, grace has got you covered because of this provision, because of all this mess of theology that somehow you're corrupted and you're unable to do what's right. And simply turn back and obey God. Like the prodigal son, he was in the pig pen. He was immersed in the pig pen. The pig pen is sin, like many of you in your addictions. You think sin repents, sin repents, going to get you into the kingdom. But no, in the pig pen, he rose up out of the pig pen when he came to himself and then went back to the Father. Isn't that a, cl a cleansing and a purging of his own self, like James 1.21 says? Therefore cleanse yourself of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and then go to the Father and receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your soul, becoming a doer of the word, and not a hearer only deceiving yourself. That's exactly what he did. He came up out of the pig pen. There's nothing mention anything about inability there. But they tell you, no, grace has you covered. So that's what you have here. Man's excuse from rendering this obedience to God and abstaining from these sins because some wolf disguised as a sheep in the pulpit or some book writer told him that he's not able to do it because of his inbred depravity or his corruption in his flesh or his unwillingness that God's got to make him willing. Well, I ask the same question again. How's God going to make you willing to do something you're unwilling to do? That's the only coercion. Is that going to work? And God doesn't work that way. He asks you to prepare your heart, you to make you have a willing and honest heart. All through the scriptures we see those type of things. But if you ask any pastor, any pundit, whatever, just send this question to him. Does a person have to stop any of these sins that we mentioned above here to receive Jesus or to remain saved after receiving him? Ask him that type of a question. Do you have to stop any of these sins listed above, including child molestation, which is, it, it, of course, is talking about all kinds of perversion there. We even ask him that. Ask him those things. Do you have to stop those things to receive Jesus or to inherit the kingdom? You're going to find out real quickly how this man-made fallacies and theologies has nullified the simple teachings of Christ that said, he who sins is of the devil. Go and sin no more. You're going to find out real fast if you do that. See, under this mess, it's he who commits the sins listed there in those scriptures above is not deceived by empty words, they're, but they're washed, sanctified, and justified in Christ. Like 1 Corinthians uh, 6.11 says. 9.10, and then they always say, well, 11 says you're washed, sanctified, and justified. Yeah, in your sins, right? You're washed, but still dirty. You're sanctified, but you're but you're impure, and you're justified in your sins. Total fallacy. So you're going to be pretty hard-pressed to find a pastor who's going to say otherwise about these scriptures. They'll promise anybody that's received Jesus this quick and easy forgiveness of these types of sins, whether they're committed occasionally or whether they're committed continually, just confess them as an apology of your inherent sinfulness because you, you're not perfect and God knows that and he loves you anyway and that you, you can't ever deny that this sin is in you or the truth is not in you. 
So you just confess it, you apologize for these things, your sinfulness, and then you just go on about your way, stepping in and out of the light along the way. Of course, you've never really been in the light to begin with. And if you say you had none of these sins, he who's, like 1 John 8 and 9, he who denies that he has sin, the truth is not in him. So just confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive them. See, that's where they get to sin, repent, sin, repent relationship. But see, John is saying, John is saying in that verse that he who has never sinned, not he who has no sin in him. That's the way the translators wanted to trick you. It's the same word in the scripture as used in the, in the, in the last verse, in the, in the 10th verse of that, that same passage. He who, sa he who has never sinned says he has never sinned, deceives himself and the truth is not in him. But see, you, you look at that and you say, he who has no sin, well, see, well, I have sin. I have inherent sinfulness. I commit these kind of sins all the time, whether in my mind or whether I outrightly do drunkenness and pornography and, and lust and perversion. So consequently then, to actually say that you don't commit these sins, you're being deceived by empty words. See how they turn, they turn it around. They turn everything around. The exact opposite of what the Scripture says, but yet it makes perfect sense to these people sitting in these under this message, they're depraved sinners, saved by free grace, not of works, can't do anything. So these types of sins then are commonplaced among all the professed and every pundit out there, 24-7 worldwide, is going to promise these people deliverance while they remain slaves to their sin, without exception. Oh, they'll say you shouldn't commit these sins. They'll say it's bad for your family and it's bad for your relationship with God. But you're not going to jeopardize your final outcome of your salvation because that's a done deal by receiving the provision. And I'm not just talking about eternal security. I'm talking about what they all preach. Whether it's the Nazarenes or the Wesleys or the Calvinists or the Baptists, it doesn't make any difference. Bottom line, bottom line, they can commit these sins and you're still going to inherit the kingdom because nobody's perfect and nobody can avoid these things because there's sin in them. And you're just a work in progress. See, what's happened here is they call it the church out there. The church. But yet they don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Strive to enter, take up your cross, deny yourself, count the cost. They don't obey anything he said you must do to inherit eternal life. And they don't follow in his footsteps to die to sin and live for righteousness. All what the scripture says that you must do to inherit eternal life. See, they're illegitimate sons in name only, masquerading themselves off to the world as representatives of Christianity while they make Christ a minister of their sins. See, theirs is a gospel of shame in the laughing stock of hell with a pretense of godliness, but wholly lacking in the mind of Christ, the divine nature that would they can, by which they could escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. They're not told they can escape because of what? Inability. You can sin and not die. You can commit these sins and you'll be okay. If the world's out there committing them, they're going to hell. But not you because you're a sinner saved by grace. So no warning in the scripture then applies to them. Only the promises apply to them. The good stuff. Get, get more things. And anybody that departs from evil and walks in righteousness before God makes himself a prey for their vain accusations and their constant, their constant threats. Because the truth fails among them and no one turns back from his evil ways. Read Isaiah 59 down to about the 15th verse. That's what he said. See, by what they've done, they keep posting on the site. They keep saying man has no righteousness. He's trying to establish his own. I asked, why is doing what God commanded you to do considered saving yourself by all you street preachers out there? Why? Why can't you tell people that they can do what God has commanded them to do? Because of what you believe about this theology. By constantly limiting man's ability 
They're saying that if a person actually does what God has commanded them to do, to stop sinning and obey him, seek him through a, a, a self-cleansing humility of repentance, no matter how long it takes, then he's overdoing it. He's doing too much, and he's trying to establish his own righteousness and save himself so he can pound his chest. See, it's, it's as though in their thinking, God doesn't allow man any credit for genuinely obeying him and departing from his evil ways, and he's always cautioning him not to do too much, lest you rob me of my sovereignty to save you in your sins. See, the scriptures